Thanks, Kate. Uh, let's go ahead and get everything started. Uh, I'm Jill Rook with the Great Plains Institute. Uh, welcome everyone to the third of the industrial uh, sector learning series. Uh, and so this one will be about the chemical sector. So Kate, if you wanna go to the next slide, I'll just go through the agenda really quickly. Um, so for today, uh, I'll just provide a, a couple quick updates on upcoming dates for um, I3 followed by uh, our chemical speakers presentation. So first we'll hear from Ed Ryder um, with an overview of the chemical sector. Uh, Ed is the director of the ACEEE's industrial program. In his current role, Ed develops and leads a strategic vision for the industrial sector, shapes the research and policy agenda, and convenes stakeholders to accelerate energy efficiency. Prior to joining ACEEE in 2019, Ed held several leadership roles at Dow Chemical, including the Director of Strategic Projects in Dow's Environmental Technology. So after Ed, uh, we'll hear about Dow's perspective and their current strategies from Gloria Margamez Menendez. Uh, Dow's, she, she is Dow's Energy Manager on Climate Change Renewables and Regulatory. In a role, Gloria Mar works to support Dow's long-term view of carbon, helping to develop and implement strategies to mitigate risk and capture value for Dow. Gloria Mar is a chemical engineer with more than 13 years of experience. Following Gloria Mar, we will hear from Dr. Laurel Harmon, the Vice President of Lanza Tech, who will highlight Lanza Tech's story and perspective. Dr. Harmon provides policy direction and leadership on international legislative and regulatory matters and develops collaborative research and demonstration projects. Dr. Harmon joined Lanza Tech from Stratus Inc. Uh, and she has also been a part of ERIM, a nonprofit research organization, and later was a technical co-founder of Nonlinear Dynamics. Finally, we will hear about OxyChem from John Pace, the Technology Development Manager at Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. John has worked for Oxy for 27 years, with his first 25 years in the chemicals division of OxyChem, and most recently with Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. John started as a process engineer and eventually transferred to the corporate engineering group for OxyChem. At Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, John is responsible for technically evaluating emergency technologies that may be of interest and ensuring that these invested technologies will perform as designed when commercialized. So then we will uh, also have some time for Q&A. If you think of any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to add them within the chat or else we may have time as well during the Q&A portion uh, for folks to raise their hand in the participants page and ask their questions individually. So, Kate, do you wanna to go to the next slide? So just a few upcoming important dates for I3. We have two more within this sector-based learning series, uh, which will be bio biofuels and pulp and paper on December 2nd, and then we'll be wrapping it up on December 16th with refining. We then have been working hard at GPI and WRI on the level setting white paper, and we are planning to share that around with participants uh, the week of January 4th, which will provide enough time to review before we have our official first plenary group, large group meeting on January 14th, uh, 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Central. And we will be sending around an updates email next week uh, that will also include a calendar hold and more information on this first large group meeting. So I guess we can then that's all the major updates we had for this morning for I3. So we can go ahead and get started with our presentations today. So Ed, I will let you start things off. Okay, super. I appreciate the opportunity, Kate, Jill, and Brad to uh, talk to the group about uh, my favorite sector, which is uh, chemicals. My role is just to briefly provide an introduction so Gloria Mar, Laurel, and John can uh, have a basis with which to uh, talk to you about the chemical sector. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, I wanna just provide uh, that overview and hit a couple of the key points relative to the topics of greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonization. Next slide. So I'll talk about uh, these areas. I'll talk about how the chemical industry provides solutions for society across a large number of segments, where the energy comes from that the chemical industry uses, some drivers for change uh, before talking about how to address that change uh, and where technology fits in to address the changes on the horizon, 
And then I uh, close with some of the challenges and opportunities that folks are pursuing. Next slide. So on the right hand side, uh, this little graphic shows the fact that a chemical industry uses materials inputs from a large variety of different areas, some of which are sectors by themselves. Uh, they use a number of those building blocks to transform those inputs into a wide variety of, of outputs, uh, materials, uh, raw chemicals, uh, and whatnot, which I'll show on the next couple of slides. But you can see, even in the simplistic version, uh, exactly. there's a large number of, of inputs. Um, those go to um, a number of different areas, as you can see on the graphic on the left-hand side, not only basic chemicals, specialties, consumer products, and agricultural products. Next slide. Well, this gives you a, a little bit of a, a picture of where those, those products go. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see a number of different icons. Uh, this is representative of how the chemical industry takes these building blocks, elements from the periodic table, and turns them into things that we use every day and which we, in general, take for granted. Um, things such as uh, materials for automobiles that lightweight the automobiles, uh, improving energy efficiency, uh, products for improving the yield of agricultural products, things that we use in our daily lives, such as cushioning and uh, mattresses and, and whatnot, and building and construction materials. I'll note that some 96% of manufactured goods directly relate to chemistry. Hence, chemistry is in just about everything that we use every day. Large portion of contribution to the gross domestic product, as you can see. Uh, and there's a large number of jobs associated with chemistry. Now, when you think about the number of processes that need to be considered in the chemical industry for improvement on reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, it's not one or two or three different processes. Um, there's over 70,000 different products uh, produced by the chemical industry. Hence, it's a wide tangle of uh, uh, different processes and products and other kinds of things. Next slide. So let me talk briefly about inputs and how the chemical industry uses the energy that comes into it. Next slide. So industry uh, uses uh, a wide variety of uh, energy inputs. Uh, the chemical well, industry in general uh, uses about 25-30% uh, of industry across the U.S., which is also related to its greenhouse gas emissions, about the same uh, proportion. If you break down the industrial wedge of the energy use that's on the left to the pie graph on the right, you can see that uh, some of the larger sectors, such as chemicals, account for a large proportion of that energy. Chemicals, refining, mining, uh, are some of the, the big ones uh, in this space. Next slide. Well, where does the energy come from? Uh, you can see that for the chemicals industry, natural gas is a large amount of what comes in relative to heat and power a little bit of purchase electricity, some petroleum, but mainly natural gas. There's also feedstocks to be concerned with. Next uh, click. Uh, where you'll see that uh, the feedstocks, not only natural gas uh, comes into play, but also ethane and other light hydrocarbons. Now ethane principally comes from natural gas. So again, you would see that natural gas is a large component of what comes in from the feedstocks as well. Uh, you'll note that there is a small amount for heat and power for coal. That's obviously a target for um, decarbonization to uh, change that out. But principally, uh, the industry, chemical industry, has already transformed uh, moving to natural gas. And one could ask the question about well, what else could be done with electricity. I'll cover that in just a minute. Next slide. Uh, so there's a number of major processes uh, that come out of the chemical industry. This slide shows a portion of those uh, that deal with catalytic processes. And you can see that uh, the size of the bubble 
here is the size of the greenhouse gas emissions. On the x-axis is the production volume in millions of metric tons. And on the y-axis is the energy consumed. What you should get from this slide is that among the top 18 chemical processes, they account for about 75% of the energy use and about 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Hence, if you made improvements in these top 18 major products, you really would be able to um, change uh, the mixture relative to greenhouse gases and energy consumption. I'll also note uh, a little bit later ammonia. Uh, ammonia is the big one relative to energy consumption and greenhouse gases. Ammonia, of course, goes into fertilizers, which goes into food, and that's part of the reason why that's huge. You also see a number of different precursors for uh, plastics here, such as ethylene and propylene, um, polyethylene down in the lower um, uh, portion. BTX is uh, benzene, toluene, and xylene. So next slide. There's a number of drivers that the chemical industry is working with. It's not just uh, greenhouse gases uh, and climate change, although that's certainly a big one. Uh, there's transformation in the energy systems. Supply chain, of course, has been rocked during COVID, but uh, supply chain challenges have occurred before that. Um, there's also uh, science-based goals, of course, which is connected to this topic, water management, and several other different changes, changes that are going on in the chemical industry. My little graphic on the upper right-hand side shows that the magnitude of change is increasing. There's a number of discontinuities that are occurring in the chemical industry at the same time, making change very, very difficult. A number of things have to be balanced. Next slide. So let's talk about the concept of decarbonization relative to the chemical industry. Uh, I put on this slide three major buckets of potential change. First, power and feedstocks. Uh, one can change the feedstocks coming in. Uh, this is where electrification comes in. It's where biofuels comes in. Um, other low carbon options there include renewable hydrogen, renewable natural gas or RNG, biofuels, and the, the list goes on. There's a number of different options there. They all have to uh, address the quality constraints, the, the feed constraints relative to regularity and other kinds of performance issues. But nonetheless, there's a, there's a bucket of, of different options in that space. Now, the chemical industry is a huge user of process heat. Um, and there's a number of opportunities in that space. Energy efficiency is foundational as well as materials efficiency because of the fact that not only does it help to save energy, but it also can provide other non-energy benefits, such as improvement of, of yield and um, a decreased maintenance, et cetera. Process heat, uh, again, is there. Separations are particularly important, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and on the right-hand side, I also want to point out supply chain is really important here. Very complex supply chains with the, uh, the chemical industry. And working with supply chain partners is a great way to potentially reduce the footprint of what's called scope three emissions. Um, and that's also uh, an area of continuous improvement um, throughout the, this process. So several different areas. Uh, let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Okay, let's talk about the technology horizon. This is process heating. If you look at the, okay, you can go to the next one, uh, which is uh, process heat. Uh, this is a cross-cutting opportunity across a number of different uh, industries. For chemicals in particular, you can see that there's a good proportion of relatively low temperature process heat. That's the light blue bar uh, here, 80 to 150 degrees C. That's a prime opportunity for electrification, uh, for uh, substitution of other technologies, which are uh, available today, but they haven't been deployed at scale as much as they probably should be. Industrial heat pumps and other things uh, fit into that category. Chemical industry also has a good amount of mid-range heat, 150 to 300 degrees centigrade, and has some in the upper ranges, 500 to uh, maybe 1100 degrees C, uh, that's where hydrogen and others can come in. Next slide. So I mentioned some of the electric technology options such as uh, heat pumps, uh, but there's a range of different technologies here. My, my graphic shows 
at the lower temperature, the lighter colors, uh, multiple options. As you get into the higher temperature ranges, fewer options at this point, some need for development there. Um, but um, certainly there are some options that could be could be considered. Uh, the issue with the chemical industry is demonstrating these at scale, improving the economics, et cetera. Next slide. Separations is another large cross-cutting opportunity. Some 40% of the energy use in the top 25 chemicals, we are, you know, we looked at some of those from catalytic, but if you look across all top 25, 40% of the energy spend is associated with, uh, with separations. Another example, uh, a prime uh, process in the chemical industry is uh, crackers, where they take uh, ethane and they crack it to ethylene. Uh, some 50% of the energy spend for that process is associated with downstream separations. So some big opportunities here in RD and D, uh, particularly using multiple forces, such as the combination of light, electric, magnetic fields, and whatnot. Um, the chemical industry uses a lot of processes on the lower left-hand side of this graphic down below. The idea is to push things more to the right-hand side, uh, which is lower energy, perhaps using uh, transformative technologies. Next slide. So I mentioned transformative technologies. There's a lot of uh, innovation that uh, is going on in this space. The idea is to take uh, materials A and B uh, and convert them into something useful that society really needs. Heat uh, is a principal factor uh, in today's processes. Uh, the challenge is to change that out for something else uh, that will help with those conversion processes over time. Multiple options in that space, some of which are being researched, some of which still need to be researched. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned some of those processes. I uh, won't get into detail on this slide, but you can see across the technology readiness um, scales. There's a number of different processes which to the upper right-hand side are available, but they need to be uh, pushed relative to their scale deployment. There's a number of technologies in flight, which are kind of in the middle, uh, and some which are up and coming on the lower left-hand side. The idea is to, uh, continue pushing across multiple different time scales and technology readiness levels to bring these uh, technologies to fruition and to reduce the energy in the greenhouse gas footprint in the chemical industry. Next slide. I'll note the transformative response here. Uh, I've talked about uh, several of them or indicated them. There's low, what I'll call low capital options, things that we could start with today where you don't have to change out the pots and pans. Uh, of the entire industry, which is very, going to be very expensive. Uh, energy efficiency, material efficiency, system efficiency, all things that can have a multitude of benefits um, while also reducing energy and greenhouse gases. Uh, briefly covered low temperature process heat, big opportunity in that space, although it's not as easy to uh, get as just uh, plug and play changing things out separations I mentioned in supply chain. In the mid-range relative to time frame, uh, there's a number of opportunities in this space that the industry also has, um, some of which are in the wings and some of which need substantial uh, development. Uh, there also are longer range plays uh, in this space, such as the transformative chemical processes that I mentioned. Um, and my point here is that we need all of these. We need um, innovative work in all this space, uh, not only at the bench scale, but also uh, at the scale of uh, production facilities. Next slide. So the challenges in this space are, are many, as you might expect. Uh, I've listed some there on the left-hand side. There's also opportunities uh, in this space. Back in 2012-2013, uh, 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 I was involved in an industry roadmap looking at ways to reduce energy and greenhouse gases. At that time, we hypothesized a game changer of taking renewable hydrogen and using it for ammonia production. At that time, uh, we thought that that was, that was a real game changer. It was really something pretty wild. Uh, Yara, the world's largest producer of ammonia, now has two demonstration plants doing just that. So there is an opportunity for a process here at, for improvement. And there's also, of course, competitive opportunities uh, in that space. Next slide. I wanted to uh, 
put a, a quote here, one of my favorite ones, that as you can see that there are opportunities in this space, brilliantly disguised as insolvable problems. Okay, so let me uh, have you click uh, there. There's some references. Uh, this will be sent out with a slide deck and then questions we'll get to after the other uh, folks have a chance to speak. So let me hand it back at that point. Thanks so much, Ed, for that introduction. This is a really broad and complex sector, so thanks for creating some context and understanding for us. Next, we'll hear about Dow's perspective and what their current strategies are from Gloria Mar. So please take it away. Thank you, and Ed, thank you. You set up the perfect stage for me to take on. So let's start with the slides, please. Just a little bit update. I'm an energy policy leader on energy and climate change issues. Uh, I changed roles a year ago. Jill, you still have my old role, but it's okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's start, uh, please. So, please, next. Yes. So, Dow's ambition is to be or to become the most innovative, customer centric, inclusive, and sustainable materials science company in the world. And um, I don't want to repeat a lot of what Ed just said, but exactly what we do is we take oil and gas uh, and several minerals. And what we do is we make very specific products. Uh, we use silicon, nitrogen, propane, um, carbon, uh, three range of molecules and fours, and ethane. And we put them into all the different catalysis, synthesis, crackers, etc. cetera. Um, all of them very energy and heat intensive uh, processes and make them into products uh, down the road. And most, a lot of our products are also intermediate products for other chemical companies. Because uh, you have to understand that the part of the chemical industries that's within it, there's several different um, chemical uh, companies. There are companies that are uh, less energy intensive because they're more down the road. Uh, taking those uh, building blocks that Ed just mentioned. So um, we have, now we have a narrower and deeper um, portfolio of solutions um, work to, the, to go to the end market. Uh, one of them is on the elephants. Uh, we do packaging and different packaging materials. Um, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of what we're doing on, the, on that space for circular economy and circularity. Uh, we have a lot of offers on the infrastructure to make buildings more energy efficient. We have coatings, et cetera. And we have a lot of products also focused on, cons uh, on the personal care. So we are a technology and solutions provider focused on moving our company into the world uh, forward. So even the next slide, I'm gonna share some examples on how different products that we offer have different sustainability um, applications and how they help uh, to reduce um, emissions. So we have, of course, a lot of coatings and as I said, a lot of uh, different solutions that go into buildings. For instance, the Dow Seal Silicon Adhesive that save energy in all these buildings that we see uh, because they, 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 they are durable and flexible bond for, for the glass. We have um, uh, in the mattressing and bedding, we have our renewable mattresses, which is, they are made with a uh, uh, recycled uh, polyurethane. We have um, a lot of the packaging that I'm going to be talking about also for the um, to make re recycle ready and, and help reduce the footprint of, of plastics. Uh, we have other solutions, for instance, that go into um, solar solar energy. For instance, on the on the on the panels, there's a little thin, thin layer of plastic that goes into the into the solar panels and it helps protect them and make them more durable. So again, we have a, a broad variety of portfolio and solutions that uh, are focused on sustainability. So if we can move forward, please. So a DAO, and I did wanted to bring these, these slides to, to, to present to you. We believe that all solutions in energy, whether it's technology-based or policy-based, must be addressed in five areas. First, in sustainability, considering all the environmental impact. Second, uh, the, society, the societal demands, including political realities and what uh, you know, our, our society needs. Third, uh, chemistry and physics, because we have to operate within what is possible and within existing technologies, and we have to work on innovation and to, and to bring better uh, technologies forward. Four, 
uh, we believe everything has to be reliable, including infrastructure. Uh, we understand the limitations uh, of the current grid design, and we believe that um, we need, as part of the decarbonization uh, strategies, to modernize the grid to to be so it will allow the different uh, renewable energies and clean energies technologies to be part of, of the solution. And of course, all of this needs to be affordable. Otherwise, it's it's impossible. So just wanted to, to give uh, you a little perspective. So Dow has been uh, working on sustainability goals since 1995. Uh, we, every time we come with 10 year goals, so the last time we set goals was on, until 2025. And some of them are in the valuing nature space. We have some of, of world leading operations on innovations, on, on circularity, and, and of course, improving our footprint. But um, this year, uh, you know, we decided to face today's challenges and demands to accelerate our action. And we, and we, made uh, mo mo three more or three new commitments around the areas of circular economy, climate protection, and safer materials, because these targets are aimed to reduce our footprint and eliminating plastic waste, plastic waste from the environment. So if we can move forward to the next slide. So in the protecting the climate, so we said that by 2030, we're gonna reduce our net annual carbon emissions by 5 million metric tons taking 2020 as a baseline. That's a 15% reduction of our, of our scope one and scope two emissions. And by 2050, we are, we, our intention is to become carbon neutral. On stop the waste, uh, what we are gonna do is by 2030, we will help stop the waste by eliminating at least 1 million metric tons of plastics uh, to be collected, reused, recycled through direct actions or partnerships. Uh, DAO is part of the, of the um, of many initiatives around the globe to, to try to move forward on, on eliminating plastic waste through the environment and being education, infrastructure, etc. And closing at the loop by 2035, all of our uh, products will be uh, either reusable or recyclable. We are also having a lot of investments uh, looking into different processes to recycle our plastics and make them uh, part of our feedstocks as well. If we move forward. So specifically on, on, on the climate change and, our, and how we're gonna achieve our carbon neutrality, we have five different areas of work. The first one will be optimizing our facilities and our processes. This is where a lot of the energy efficiency projects fall. Um, so far, for instance, we have executed four major uh, projects that will help save around uh, almost 600,000 metric tons of emissions and of course, We've been doing this for many years. Now we have an internal carbon price that we put into consideration in any major project investment and R&D. On the second strategy will be increase our renewable energy. We have a goal to be using 750 megawatts for renewable sources by 2025. We're close to that goal. We are already at around 700 megawatts. Uh, we're the, on, the number one purchaser of renewable energy in the chemical industry and we're among 20, the top 15 uh, global corporations using renewable energy and having um, renewable energy purchases. The latest uh, contracts that we have done, we're announcing in Argentina, in Brazil, in Kentucky, and in Texas. And we have from wind to solar to hydro to biomass. We have the whole range and we're, we're keep moving forward and we keep evaluating more and more areas when we can do this. Um, because as Ed said, not everything is electricity. We have a lot of heat and steam, and that's not there yet on renewable sources um, in a sustainable way. Um, because yes, there's biomass, but, but at the large and scale that we need, it's not sustainable. Then on the third pillar, we are evaluating different carbon capture uses, um, use and storage projects in Europe and in North America. Um, in the U.S., we're founding members of the U.S. Gulf Coast um, uh, Carbon Collaborative Initiative, where we're evaluating with different partners, with different industries and partners, solutions for mainly Texas and Louisiana, and how we can start doing carbon capture projects in that region. Uh, third, a fourth, we are developing low carbon technologies for emission reductions. So we have, as part of our R&D process uh, and, and what we're doing, we, are, we have a low carbon EDH technology that will help us reduce 40, 50% emissions based on, on in compared with 
current processes. Uh, we have um, an agreement and we're working with Shell on developing electric fracking for steam methane reformation. And of course, as, as again, we use a steam methane reformation, which produces hydrogen. Um, and we, are, we have a lot of retrofit in our processes to use this hydrogen as part of the pre-combustion on our processes and also in our furnaces. Uh, we're developing, again, materials to help reduce emissions uh, for customers and industries. And I was just sharing some of the examples of what we do. We estimate that today our current portfolio of products uh, avo help avoid our um, around 400 million metric tons of, 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 of CO2 annually because of, this, of the efficiency that they bring down the road. And again, we're gonna keep working hard on these. So um, this is part of our strategy. This is our roadmap and um, uh, we can, this is what I have to present for you. We can move forward and I will be taking questions after the others. Thank you. Great, thanks Gloria Mark for providing that deep dive into Dow and your vision for sustainability within the company. Um, Next, we'll hear from Laurel Harmon on how Lanza Tech is creating a space within the sector with their innovative technologies. So Laurel, we'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, we can go to the first slide, or actually the second slide. So Lanza Tech is a very small company. It's interesting to follow the description of Dow. Um, and we, our focus is actually to develop transformative processes that enable recycling of carbon from waste sources to replace fuels and chemicals um, in a number of different supply chains. So here I'll focus on the chemical um, work that we've been doing. We're a privately held company. We have a very diverse set of investors you can see at the bottom, and it's a global set of investors. And that reflects our operations uh, founding in New Zealand um, with bases in China and India, presence in Europe, and our headquarters in the US. You'll see there, there are some major chemical players in, in, among our investor mix, such as BASF, Sekisui Chemicals in Japan. Um, let's see, I'm not sure who else is on here, as well as um, oil majors that have an interest in changing the entire supply chain. So if you go to the next slide, this uh, gives you an, a view into our core technology. What we do is in contrast to the thermocatalytic type um, processes that you were hearing about before, we actually use the power of biology to do chemical transformations. And the process itself is called gas fermentation. And what we're doing is we have uh, we have developed a microbe which consumes gases and produces chemicals. The first commercial product is ethanol, which you'll hear about others. And what, what it's doing is very similar to beer making, except the input is gas and we don't use yeast, we use another process. The input then is, our first commercial input is industrial emissions, and I'll describe that more in detail. If you click again, it's possible to take solid wastes and through a gasification process, produce gases which feed into exactly the same fermentation process to produce the same products. And what we're looking forward to in the future is also scenarios, if you do another click, in which um, CO2 is being, can be drawn directly from the air and through either CO2 electrolysis or in conjunction with hydrogen from uh, electrolysis of water, again, provides a suitable gas stream for the fermentation. So the core fermentation block remains the same. And if you do three more clicks, you'll see products. Our first products have been fuels. The spent microbes themselves are actually a high protein product that's going into fish food market. And then I'll talk here about chemicals, which in effect and allows us to close the loop. Next slide, please. So this isn't science fiction. Uh, we actually have a plant operating in, in China. This is the first commercial plant. We are a technology licensor, which means that we are not solely responsible 
been for owning and operating plants, and it's allowing us to deploy broadly. This particular plant is producing ethanol from steel mill emissions. It's located on the site of a steel mill. The emissions are being fed directly into the fermentation process, and the microbes themselves are producing ethanol, which is then just separated in a conventional way. The majority of ethanol is going into the road transport sector in China. However, I'll talk about how some of this ethanol is actually being used in the chemical sector today. So far, it's produced over 19 million gallons of ethanol directly from steel mill emissions and is the equivalent of 96,000 tons of CO2 avoided from being released into the atmosphere. So this is a, a, the first real commercial example of what's called carbon capture and utilization. Next slide, please. At, this shows three more commercial plants that are in construction around the world. Uh, at the top is actually a second plant that's being constructed in China, again for ethanol production, and again using steel mill emissions. In the middle is a project with Indian oil in the Panipat refinery in, in India, and there we're actually taking waste emissions from a refining operation, again to produce ethanol. And the plant at the bottom is with ArcelorMittal. It's in construction in Belgium, again producing ethanol initially. I'll talk about how plants can switch products. Um, just to make maybe a, a data point, the, the ethanol used in road transport from the ArcelorMittal plant will save the emissions equivalent of 80,000 cars on the road. So it's the equivalent of taking 80,000 cars off the road. Next slide, please. So at the bottom, um, it shows how gas fermentation can be used to produce ethanol, and then there are products that are that or applications that directly use the ethanol itself. Fuel, obviously, that's a typical application in the US. There are chemical applications for purified ethanol. We're all painfully familiar with the use of ethanol as a, um, a disinfectant today. Um, so there's a lot more ethanol in our households for non-potable use these days. In the middle are chemical products that can be derived from ethanol. I won't focus on it today, but jet fuel is one which we are commercializing today and building a 10 million gallon per year sustainable aviation fuel plant using ethanol as a feedstock. I'll talk about some other chemical applications though as well. And at the top are new direct fermentation products. So these are cases in which we're producing chemicals from the fermentation to, by changing the microbes internal chemistry. So we're, we're modifying the biochemistry to produce new products like isopropyl alcohol. Again, we're seeing that as sanitizers. Um, MEG, which is used in plastics or acetone, which is in, um, has many applications, but includes coatings and um, plexiglass. Next slide, please. So this is an application in which the ethanol itself is used um, in cleaning products. This was announced uh, just a, maybe two months ago in which the Mabel group in Switzerland has incorporated highly purified ethanol that came from the plant in China, so produced from steel mill emissions. They are now putting this into a line of cleaning products. And you can see in the middle, the little label that they're using to say, this is coming from recycled CO2 to highlight for the consumer that this is a different source than the, the consumer is used to. Could we go to the next slide, please? Here, we show how we can use ethanol as a building block in a different way by first transforming it chemically into ethylene. This is a well-known um, commercially practiced process, which effectively is taking one molecule of water out of the ethanol, and that leaves ethylene, which you've heard about in both of the preceding presentations, is one of the fundamental building blocks in the current chemical sector. Moving to the left, you then, by creating longer and longer chains, you produce longer olefins. 
So addressing that entire market. And that is ultimately what leads to the precise combination of hydrocarbons that's needed in aviation fuel, which is the, the origin of our sustainable aviation fuel technology. To the right, however, ethylene, of course, as you've seen already, becomes a building block in a number of different applications and materials, such as polyethylene plastics or MEG. Um, the next slide, please. So this is a very recent announcement, actually, that in collaboration with uh, the French oil major Total and the consumer products com company L'Oreal, they have announced the first uh, commercial packaging in the consumer goods space using polyethylene that was produced again from ethanol that came from the plant in China. So this is polyethylene from recycled carbon emissions. Next slide, please. So um, I mean, PET plastics we're very familiar with in terms of water bottles and other types of packaging. And there are two primary components to PET. One is PTA and the other is monoethylene glycol or MEG. And that is conventionally made from ethylene going through ethylene oxide as an intermediate. So if you do another click, that dehydration transformation of ethanol to ethylene then allows the ethanol from steel mill emissions to enter this particular supply chain. And we're doing that work with India glycols in India. Um, yes, go ahead and do another click. Uh, I, before I go on though, that is being uh, will be transformed into PET at Far Eastern New Century in Taiwan. And then that PET is going into packaging and textiles. I highlight that just to illustrate that for a company that started out focusing on fuels, it's been very interesting to, to get some insight into the complexity of the supply chains, which obviously Ed and Gloria Mar know extremely well. Um, we're getting our taste of it. But I talked about modifying the microbe. And so another area of effort for us that's in an earlier stage of development is to produce that MEG directly in the fermentation process. And we actually just, uh, the DOE just announced a project in which we will be taking unrecyclable plastics, gasifying them, and then producing MEG, thus completely closing the loop from plastics back into plastics. Next slide, please. So here's an example. I mentioned acetone earlier. Um, acetone, as I said, has really wide applications. Here, the process change has really significant um, environmental impacts as well as the supply, uh, supply availability impact. So conventionally, acetone is produced in what's called the cumene process. The actual uh, primary product of that process is phenol. Acetone is simply a byproduct. And this is a process that has um, fairly significant environmental um, implications. We have demonstrated and scaled up production of acetone directly from gas. So another case then, we've modified the biochemistry, we've tuned this microbe. Instead of producing ethanol, it's producing over 90% acetone. And we've demonstrated the ability then to take that microbe and drop it into the bioreactors, which you see behind the, the graph in that figure. It was producing ethanol from the, the first microbe. We clean that out, drop in the acetone, and in a very short time, acetone microbe. In a very short time, then it's, it becomes an acetone production plant. So here, we're in doing that, We've not only changed the feedstock in, from conventional feedstocks into waste gases. We've changed the process. We're using biological processes, which are low temperature, low pressure. And we have now a really transformative manufacturing capability. You go to the next slide. Conventionally, um, the large capital investments are required to 
in many cases to switch products and therefore it, it, it's necessary to predict what the demand will be several years out with by using biological processes in this type of fermentation we can keep putting I said we can drop the microbe into the, an existing bioreactor. That means the commercial plants that you're seeing can be changed to produce something else. And so we think about that the bioreactor as the hardware, and then the microbe is the software, which can be changed out. So if you click again, that means a plant that started out producing ethanol can, in a matter of weeks, uh, be changed to produce acetone, to produce isopropanol, or whatever range of products we end up producing. We've demonstrated over a hundred different products directly from the fermentation. So one more click, I think. And so this, what this allows is a, a different model of manufacturing in which there can be very quick reaction to fluctuations in the market and by using waste gases and all these diverse inputs, we're also separating um, the, the feedstock from the existing commodity markets. So the last slide is just a con conclusion illustrating how I said our goal is to recycle carbon and in, and in doing so by capturing these waste carbon resources creating chemical products and, in some, and drawing on existing waste plastics, waste materials from society, as well as manufacturing, we create and enable a fully circular economy. And we're certainly hoping that that becomes the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laurel, for describing all of Lanzotech's great processes. Uh, next, we'll hear from John Pace on OxyChem strategy. So, John, I'll let you take it away. All right, thanks. So, again, this is John Pace with uh, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. Um, I'll start by uh, just talking about Oxy Low Carbon Ventures for a minute. So, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures was formed in um, 2018 to basically uh, help Oxy um, develop a path and realize our sustainability goal of being a net neutral company by 2040. So, you know, we were formed to basically create that pathway and then to, you know, see it come to fruition. So as part of that, um, as, as part of that, I'll focus on kind of three things that we're looking at specifically that, uh, you know, can impact our chemicals uh, division and then can also, uh, you know, potentially impact the chemical sector. So, Rather big picture overview, I'm going to just get into a few specifics that I thought, um, you know, might be of interest to the group. So, you know, first, uh, of course, we are an oil company and being our primary product is oil and gas, um, you know, for the prime, uh, for the majority of what is sold, there's re it's really not practical to say you're going to remove that CO2 um, from production, because obviously if it goes to transportation, let's say it goes to a car, goes to a ship, goes to a plane, when they consume that oil or gas, it's going to create CO2. So for us to be sustainable, we understood quickly that what we have to do is basically take that CO2 back out of the air that our product puts into the air. So with that, we um, uh, we found a company and teamed up with a company called Carbon Engineering out of Canada that is a direct air capture technology that um, basically uses caustic as a scrubbing solution to scrub CO2 out of the air. So that in and of itself is a chemical operation and you know, is, uh, you know, really the definition of, of what a chemical plant does, right? We do probably all this, you know, everybody that operates as a chemical manufacturer does that in some capacity scrubbing, right? And if you look at all the components that make up a DAC plant, um, you've got a scrubber, you've got basically a clarifier, you've got a calciner, you've got a slaker, these are the four primary pieces, and those prim uh, four primary unit operations technologies are all core to chemical operations. So that in and of itself, you know, is a chemical operating plant. And our belief is that, um, you know, moving forward, there is going to need to be so much uh, CO2 removed from the air, and this, uh, you know, is a primary way to do it that 
you know, this, this could end up being uh, a major chemical sector moving forward, you know, in the decades to come. And in fact, it could be the biggest chemical sector in 40 or 50 years. Uh, you know, if you look at reports and studies that have been done that says we need to remove gigatons of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere to, you know, maintain our temperatures, that, uh, you know, uh, with those gigatons, our, you know, our belief is a practical chemical plant that would be a direct air capture plant would remove roughly a million tons a year uh, of CO2 from the atmosphere. Well, to get to gigatons, if you have one chemical plant that's doing one million, you, you're going to need thousands of these one million ton plants to get to the gigaton level. So, again, just a huge energy, that, a huge chemical sector that could be created there. And, uh, you know, we are working on the first commercial plant to be put in operation. We formed a joint venture called 1.5. And um, the 1.5 is uh, we're actively working on, um, like I say, com uh, building a commercial plant for the direct air capture technology. Uh, the next specific example um, focuses around ethylene, and again, you've heard that mentioned. This will, I think, be the third time now you've heard the ethylene mentioned. So, uh, OxyChem is uh, one of the largest um, uh, PVC producers in the world, and as uh, one of the feedstocks for PVC is ethylene, so we're a very large ethylene consumer. and. Uh, another one of our investments and ventures that we're looking at is with a company called Simvita, and uh, Simvita is a uh, molecular uh, molecular biology company that does genetic engineering. And so, what we are working on them with is they are doing genetic engineering to create microorganisms that actually consume CO2 and water and produce ethylene. So basically. The bugs eat the CO2 in the water and the bugs spit out um, uh, ethylene. So we are invested in them. We're doing this on lab scale, but we have plans to build a, uh, a demonstration plan and then to move that forward uh, again with Simvita. So again, another example of, you know, if we could go to that, obviously then a major feedstock for our chemicals division, uh, you know, could actually instead of, you know, using ethanol, and we talk about ethanol, and there's ways to get ethanol with less CO2, but traditional ethanol, instead of using that as your starting point, uh, you could actually use CO2 as your starting point to have the ethylene, so we're excited about that. And then the last one is a, a company, another joint venture that Oxy Low Carbon Ventures have formed called Terra Lithium, and what this does is um, it's a, a technology to produce lithium hydroxide from um, lithium that's contained in uh, brines, uh, naturally occurring brines that are in the ground. And I, of course, I think everybody's aware, you know, lithium and the lithium market is huge to expand as it moves forward due to the uh, demand for lithium uh, batteries for electric vehicles. So you might say, well, why would, why would Oxy, <clears throat> why would Oxy want to get into the lithium business? Because Obviously, if we go to electric cars from gasoline cars, well, we're not going to buy as much of the oil that we sell. Well, as OxyChem, we are one of the largest chloralkali producers in the world, and lithium hydroxide is actually a natural extension of that. So we're one of the largest, largest sodium hydroxide producers in the world. We are one of the largest potassium hydroxide producers in the world. This would be lithium hydroxide, which is actually just a natural extension of what we already do. So again, for our chemicals business, you know, we see the potential for the lithium hydroxide business to become even bigger than the potassium hydroxide business. Um, uh, so again, uh, just a natural fit for our company and moving forward. So uh, just kind of quick, a few minutes to kind of give some examples there of what Oxy Low Carbon Ventures is doing and what we're looking at and how Oxy is working to become uh, a net zero company to meet our sustainability goals. Thank you. Great, thanks John for providing those three main strategies from OxyChem and Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. Um, I'll now uh, send it over, I guess, to Debbie Weil from WRI who will then be monitoring and moderating the Q&A portion.